Hello and welcome to Poetry Techniques in 30 Minutes. Of all the ways you can spend 30 minutes of your time on the World Wide Web, you have chosen to learn poetry techniques. I thank you for this amazing choice and hope you're looking forward to all the thoughts and feelings that you will soon set free on the wings of poetry. So here's the plan. By the end of this tutorial, you will be able to write a poem in one of the most famous poetic techniques of all time, the Shakespearean sonnet. Now, in order to get there, we will first seek to understand what is poetry, learn different poetic techniques, including rhyme, alliteration, assonance, and accentual rhythm. And then we shall combine these techniques into poetic forms, including the Shakespearean sonnet. Before we dive into poetry techniques, what is poetry? Well, according to the dictionary, Poetry is writing that formulates a concentrated imaginative awareness of experience in language chosen and arranged to create a specific emotional response through meaning, sound, and rhythm. That is quite a mouthful. But let's take a closer look at this definition, but it, because it does capture many important aspects of poetry. When you write poetry, you use language and words and the properties of these words such as the meaning that they convey, the sound that they make, and the rhythm that you can create using these sounds in order to affect the emotions of your audience. The essence of that definition is brilliantly captured by these two quotes. Poetry is ordinary language raised to the nth power by Paul Engel. And as Samuel Taylor Coleridge marvelously puts it, poetry, the best words in the best order. So what's all this about technique then? What's so technical about poetry? Technique is important to just about any art form. Just think about playing a guitar or painting, for example. Now in poetry, you can use technique to make language your trusted ally so that you find the perfect words to emote, to entertain, and to express yourself. As the end goal of this tutorial is the Shakespearean sonnet, Let's take a look at an example of what we're gunning for. Now we are about to read one of the original Shakespearean sonnets written by the bard himself in 1609. Sonnet number 130. My mistress eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are done? If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks, and in some perfumes is there more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven, I think my love is rare, as any she belied with false compare. How's that for a bit of 17th century satire? Looking at this poem, you might notice an underlying structure, certain patterns that lend it a rhythm. Now, to understand these patterns and these structures, we'll need to begin with the basics. So, with the blessings of the bard, let's get started. The most basic way to give structure to words is to group the words into lines and the lines into stanzas. Stanza with two lines is a couplet, three lines forms a triplet, four for a quatrain, and five gives you a quintain. I'm going to pause for a quick digression here and read out the couplet on the left. True wit is nature to advantage dressed, what oft was thought but never so well expressed. Now this seriously special piece of writing, to me it really speaks about the very nature of art itself. What I love about this couplet so much is that it both explains as well as serves as an example for how art forms, such as poetry, can be used to express everyday ideas in an extraordinary way. Poets derive much of the power from the sounds of spoken words. There are several phonetic properties of language that you can employ. The first device that we shall talk about is rhyme. Rhyme is something that we've all learned about since childhood. 
but let us take a look at some of the nuances. The pair of words hunter and temper exhibit ending rhyme. Hunter ends with ter and temper with per. Now these are not the exact same syllable, but they do have a similar ending sound. So it's the er uh in these two words that makes this pair demonstrate ending rhyme. On the other hand, timber and harbor end with the exact same syllable, timber, harbor. Therefore, we could say that this is an example of last syllable rhyme. If the last two syllables of a pair of words have similar sounds, such as conviction and prediction, then we can refer to it as a double rhyme. Moving on to the next phonetic technique, assonance. Assonance is a repetition of vowel sounds. Let's read out this line. On a proud round cloud and white high night. Now, proud and round do not rhyme, but the vowel sound ow is used repeatedly for the phonetic effect. Similarly, the vowel sound i is used in white, high, and night. Closely related to assonance is alliteration, the repetition of consonant sounds in the first syllables of words and phrases. While I nodded nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping. The repeated use of N over here is what creates the alliterative effect. Rhyme, assonance, and alliteration. We have seen how these harness the sound of language to add spice to poetry. The sound of language can also be used to create rhythm that can take your verse to the next level. We first break words up in their individual sounds in order to get the syllables, which is the most basic tool for creating rhythm. For example, feet has one syllable, toaster has two, toast and ter. Any guesses for how many syllables in the final word? Some might have guessed three, but remember, it is pronounced business and not busyness. It is in fact a word with two syllables. It's a grim reminder of the English language's ridiculous system of spelling. You can use syllables to create rhythm by deliberately choosing the number of syllables in each line. Take a look at the snippet from one of my poems. There's nothing quite like the yawn in the late eve or early morn. Each line contains eight syllables, creating a uniform rhythm. You don't always need to use the same number of syllables in each line. You could, for example, alternate between longer and shorter lines. Another important tool for rhythm are the stress patterns created by pronunciation. We apply stress by emphasizing particular syllables using greater loudness, higher pitch, and longer durations. Here is a simple method I use to identify the stress pattern in any word. To demonstrate this method, we shall use the word pattern itself as an example. First, identify the syllables in the word. In this case, it's pat and er, uh, pattern. Next, slowly speak the word while outrageously emphasizing individual syllables. Let's try this with the first syllable emphasized. Pattern, pattern. As you can see, I'm nearly shouting out the first syllable while making the second syllable almost silent. Pattern. Now let's try it with the emphasis on the second syllable. Pat un, pat un. So that should make step three quite easy. It's fairly obvious that in pattern, the stress is upon the first syllable, quite simply, because emphasizing it makes the word sound less ridiculous. Now this should come to you quite easily with some practice. In the meanwhile, you can refer to dictionaries, which generally identify the stress pattern of words. Now, why not pause the video for a few seconds and practice with the three words at the bottom of the screen before we move on. If you're comfortable with stress patterns, you can start arranging stressed and unstressed syllables into patterns of your choosing. This is how you can create what's known as accentual meter. Now, a basic unit of accentual meter is called a foot, 
Uh, there, here are a few famous types of feet, uh, starting off with the trochee, which is a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable, such as habit. And I am is an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable. Account is a good example. And anapists, which are two unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable, as in go to hell. When we look at syllabic and accentual rhythm, combining the two creates a fantastic phonetic effect that is used widely in classical English poetry. Many of you might have heard of iambic pentameter, which has quite recently been popularized by Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. It's a rhythm that combines five iams, uh, in other words, 10 syllables per line. Now, there are several such combined patterns that you can create. And oft the wisdom wakes, suspicion sleeps. Can you hear the stress pattern in this line? Why don't you pause the video, read this line out aloud, and see if you can feel the rhythm yourself. I hope by now you can see that this line is made up of 10 syllables, and these 10 syllables can be broken up into five pairs, and in each pair there's an unstressed followed by a stressed syllable. And oft the whiz, the wake, suspicion sleeps. And as we have seen, this combination of unstressed followed by stressed is called an iam. And there are five of them in this line, which makes this a line of iambic pentameter. Now, John Milton's epic Paradise Lost has line after glorious line in iambic pentameter. And it's a great poem to read if you want to understand how the old masters used accentual and syllabic rhythm in combination. This is a stanza from another famous poem. Why don't you pause the video, read the stanza out aloud, and try and identify the meter that the poet has used. Like a wolf on the fold. Da da dum, da da dum. We see here that there are two unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable. In other words, an anapist. Each line consists of 12 syllables comprising four feet of anapists. Now this tells us that Lord Byron employed anapistic tetrameter in writing The Destruction of Senachery. Some people say that the anapistic tetrameter is a light-hearted meter that can be used say in comical poems, to create a musical lilting effect. However, in the destruction of Sennacherib, the usage of anapestic tetrameter evokes the sound of horses galloping on a battlefield. The Assyrian came down like a wolf on the fold, and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold, and the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly on deep Galilee. Fantastic. So you now know how to create lines with syllabic and accentual rhythm. You've armed yourself with the variety of phonetic tools like rhyme and alliteration. So what next? It's time to put them all together and bring your poetry to life. It's time to explore poetic forms. Poetic forms are like formulas that combine multiple techniques. Some of the famous ones are sonnets, limericks, villanelles from France, haikus from Japan, and guzzles from India. There are countless forms that you can use, and you are free to concoct your own. It's all up to your imagination. Let's take a look at a few of these forms. Limericks mostly serve the noble purpose of comic relief with a healthy dose of vulgarity. A flea and a fly and a flu were trapped, so what could they do? Let us flee, said the fly, let us fly, said the flea. So they flew through a flaw and the flu. I suggest you pause this video and read the other poems. And while you do so, try and search for the underlying formula behind the limerick. Oh, and watch out for that fourth poem. 
And behold, the Limerick formula. It's a single stanza with five lines. The rhyme scheme is usually A-A-B-B-A. -A -B -B -A. What does that mean? Each letter represents one of the five lines in the Limerick. Lines with the same letter rhyme with each, rhyme with each other. In this case, the first two lines and the last line rhyme with each other, while the third and fourth lines rhyme with each other as well. Also, limericks are mostly written using an anapestic accentuometer. Of course, the limericks rarely follow these to the letter and these rules are treated more like guidelines. This beauty is the villanelle, an intricate form that originates from French poetry. Please pause the video and read out this famous piece from Elizabeth Bishop called One Art. If you're finished reading the poem, I now beg your permission to indulge in reading it myself. The art of losing isn't hard to master, so many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day except the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing further, losing faster. Places and names and where it was you meant to travel, none of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch, and look, my last hour, next to last, of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost to cities, lovely ones, and vaster. Some realms I owned to reverse a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture. I love, I shan't have lied, it's evident. The art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it, like disaster. I hope you love that poem, because by the time we are done with our analysis, there is a chance that you will begin to hate it. To break down the villanelle into its formula, we will first need to understand the refrain. We didn't cover the refrain earlier, so I'll just slip it in here. A refrain is basically a repeating word. For example, we see that master is being used repeatedly in this poem. But how does this fit into the villanelle formula? In the villanelle, the last word in the first line, represented here by master in italics, is used as a refrain in the last words of stanzas two and four. The last word in the third line, which in this case is disaster, and is underlined throughout, is used as a refrain in stanzas three and five. The last word of lines one and three are also used as refrains in the last words of lines three and four respectively in the final stanza. Confused? We are not done with this poem yet. Villanelles also employ a rhyme scheme. The first and third lines of the first stanza, represented by green, rhymes with the first and third lines of every stanza, and also with the fourth line of the sixth and final stanza. Additionally, the second line of the first stanza rhymes with the second line of every stanza. Well, I did tell you this form would be an intricate one. The formula is laid out here, but finding some time to read the villanelle again is your best bet to actually understanding it. Before we move on, I'd like to draw your attention to the highlighted parts of this poem. Words like master, disaster, and fluster rhyme quite strongly, but gesture and last R are much weaker rhymes. Here, we see the poet not trying overtly hard to stick to the rhyme scheme and giving importance instead to the meaning she wishes to convey. In the final line, she drops a phrase write it that goes completely against the flow of the rest of the poem this jolts the reader and allows the poet to spark attention when she wants it these are great illustrations of the fact that poets need to be fearless about bending the rules when it suits the poem these deviations can be used very effectively and there's no reason why you cannot break out from these defined formulas we now return to the poem that got us started, William Shakespeare's Sonnet number 130. Can you now see the formula behind the sonnet? Pause the video if you'd like to take a crack at deciphering it yourself. 
Here is the formula that we have sought. The Shakespearean sonnet contains three quatrains followed by a couplet. The quatrains use an ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme, which means that the alternate lines rhyme with each other. And the couplet uses an AA -A rhyme scheme, which means that both the lines rhyme. The entire poem uses iambic pentameter. And just a reminder, that means that it's five pairs of iams. Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, and so on. You can see here that the rhyme scheme has been highlighted. And here we see the iambic pentameter with the stressed syllables being underlined. You can clearly see the unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed pattern that's followed throughout this stanza, except in the beginning of the second line where choral is stressed followed by unstressed instead of the other way around. And as I said before, feel free to break the rules when you see fit. I'm happy to present to you another poem written in a Shakespearean sonnet form, this one by yours truly. If into poems you would like to dive, then you must labor like a farmer's ox. Without trouble and toil, no art may thrive. It's not enough to think outside the box. Amongst all forms of poems, there are few which captures people's hearts like the sonnet. Oh, what would all of them say if they knew the endless pain it brings to the poet. We desperately search for words that rhyme in 10 syllables, the words we compress, and then to rub our wounds with salt and lime, the stress on stresses brings us some more stress. So spare a thought for those who write sonnets, to bring you joy, we die a thousand deaths. And with that, we are at the end of our tutorial. So where do you go from here? You become a poet. But how do you do that? Well, if you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all others. Read a lot and write a lot. But what do you write? Where do you get these poems from? How do poems grow? They grow out of your life. And if there's one thing that you should take away from this tutorial, it is that we all write poems. It is simply the poets are the ones who write in words. And to help my fellow poets, I've created an app called Pocket Poet, which can help you search for words using rhyme, syllable count, and even stress patterns. So when you're looking for the right word to fit into your poem, Pocket Poet might be the best tool to have by your side. So do download it. Um, it's available for Android right now. You might find it handy while writing poems. There are several helpful resources that you can find online. Uh, here are a few links to get you started. My thanks to everyone who has watched this tutorial. Now, without further ado, unleash your newfound skills and write yourself a poem. Goodbye. <laughs>